This is the HMS alarm. In the 1700s, the British were uh, looking to combat shipworm. It was a worm that attacked the wood. And so they decided, rather than go with a wooden boat, they would try their hand at a copper boat. So they made this copper boat. And it went out, and when it first returned to harbor after its first voyage, the iron nails that had been used to attach the copper had turned to mush, except where there was paper. Now, the copper itself had been shipped with paper, just like we might ship metals today with something on it to protect it and wrap it. And sometimes when the copper was attached with the iron nails and the iron fasteners, someone hadn't removed the paper right around the iron nail. And in those cases, the nail was fine. So they didn't know why, but they decided that from then on, it was decided that iron nails should not come into contact with copper skin in the presence of seawater. So here's my question. What's wrong with an aluminum nail through a copper flashing on a roof detail? Go ahead and hit pause. We talked about this a little bit in the wood discussion. I want to expand on it a bit in the metal context. If we have two different metals touching, and if it's either in a humid environment or a roof, someplace where it's going to be exposed to water, then there can be what's called galvanic action, galvanic action or galvanic corrosion. Now, anytime an old battery, you see an old battery that says that like kind of weird oozing, that's the same process. And really, anytime you see rust, what you're looking at is galvanic corrosion. And so what happens is when we have metals that have different galvanic number, and so the numbers range from anode to cathode. So aluminum is the most anode in this list, and copper is on the cathode side. You see there are two different stainless steels here and here. That's because there are different flavors of stainless steel depending on what the alloy makeup is of the chromium and the nickel and so forth. So it depends with stainless steel. There are different places it can be on this. But anyhow, you see it goes aluminum, zinc, steel, iron, stainless steel that's active, tin, lead, copper, and stainless steel that's passive. If the surface, like an aluminum roof or a copper roof, if the surface is closer to the anode side of this list, and the fastener is closer to the cathode side, you're probably going to be okay. If the surface and cathode are close together in number, you may be okay. So if they're close together on this list. But if they're far apart on the list, and the surface is on the cathode side, and the fastener is on the anode side of the surface on this list, that's where you have trouble, especially in the presence of water especially in the presence of water. So if we have uh, mild steel bolts that are in contact with stainless steel, that could be a problem. Other common difficult adjacencies, if we have copper and galvanized steel fasteners, if it's a humid condition in a, a roof, that could be a problem. If we have brass and galvanized steel fasteners under humid conditions or a roof, that could be a problem. If we have aluminum, and galvanized steel fasteners under humid conditions. That could be a problem. If we have stainless steel, as I mentioned, and galvanized steel fasteners under humid conditions or roof, that could be a problem. If copper and zinc are anywhere near each other, that could be a problem. If steel and zinc are anywhere near each other, that could be a problem. If mortar and zinc, even, are in contact with each other, that could be a problem. And even certain woods, those with really low pHs, like white cedar and Douglas fir, if they're mixed with zinc, that could be a problem. And so to separate the two, we need an insulator. We need something that's going to kind of separate them. Now, when I was a kid, I remember hearing about them finding some problem with the Statue of Liberty, and they actually closed it down for a while. They closed the Statue of Liberty down for a while to tourists. Uh, I remember when they reopened, not long after they reopened, we went there and they had fixed it. And they tried to explain what they fixed but as a 10-year-old or however old I was, I don't really remember understanding it. But let me tell it to you. So what happened was Gustav Eiffel, the same guy who built Eiffel's Tower, uh, he was around the same time uh, the, the engineer of the um, Statue of Liberty. And the Statue of Liberty has a wrought iron structure. 
and it's affixed to a copper skin. So we have copper with iron, the same trouble we keep hearing about, especially if it's exposed to water. And obviously the Statue of Liberty is in a pretty humid climate and a very maritime area. It's surrounded on water by every side. So Eiffel anticipated this actually, where there was an iron structure attached to the copper skin, he put a piece of insulation in between the two to help prevent galvanic corrosion. But after like 100 years, during routine inspection of the, of the statue, they found that the insulation had, had worn away. And there were many places where the iron structure was now in contact with the copper skin. And galvanic corrosion had started to set in. So what they did is they closed the Statue of Liberty and they replaced all of the connections that had had insulation, they replaced the insulation with a plastic instead and reopened the statue. Now, Eiffel's kind of an interesting character because he was trained as an architect and he was trained as an engineer. He went ahead and built Eiffel Tower and he did the Statue of Liberty. He became wildly famous. The French, of course, tried to build the Panama Canal before we did and Eiffel was the engineer in charge of that effort or part of that effort. And when that effort failed catastrophically and there were allegations and, and confirmation of corruption, he was put on trial. I don't think he was ever accused of direct corruption, but he was accused of helping to solicit money for the endeavor when he supposedly knew that it wasn't going to work out. And he was sentenced to two years in jail. He won on appeal, but he was done with architecture and engineering at that point. and he set his sights instead to experiments in meteorology and uh, aerodynamics. And actually, Eiffel became a, a pioneer in aerodynamics in the same way he was in steel structure. Now, there are times when we actually want this kind of corrosion to happen. It's called cathodic protection. And they're pretty rare, but I figured I'll pass them on to you anyway. If we have like a steel water tank, we'll sometimes put pieces of zinc on the bottom of the steel water tank. We'll attach them to the bottom. And the zinc is used as kind of a sacrificial anode. And when it corrodes, it produces a layer of protection on the bottom of the steel tank that the steel itself can enjoy.